Starkey, and my guest this time is poet Emma Treas. Emma, welcome. Hi, David. Great to be here. Yeah, I've been trying to get you on the show for years. <laughs> I, I feel like I should make a big mark on my calendar, too. I know. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, <laughs> no. Well, and I've been so keen to have you on because you are one of the finest poets, not just in our town, but really in the country, in my opinion. So Thank you it's so much. really exciting to have you here. And I really appreciate that. And we're we're going to hear some poems, old and new, from you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before we get going, I'm always curious about people's background. I know that you were involved as a journalist in, in Miami, mm -hmm. but could you just give people who don't know you a little little background? Well, uh, I was born and raised in Miami mm -hmm. in South Florida, and I lived there all my life up until 10 years ago when I moved to Santa Barbara. So um, I'm the daughter of Cuban immigrants. My first language was Spanish. Mm -hmm. Although I would say my English is, my vocabulary is uh, is a lot wider in English mm -hmm. at this point. And I think that's primarily because I uh, learned to speak Spanish uh, by ear, you know, uh, in the household with family and right. friends of families, and I never really read or wrote in Spanish. Oh, interesting. But I did a lot of reading, obviously, and a lot of writing mm -hmm. in English. Um, so yeah, I've always loved language and books. My mother used to take us to the library every week and, you know, we had book clubs and I was just reading, reading all the time. And I, I think that's true of all writers. Our first love is, is the language, mm -hmm. you know, the sound of it, the way it looks on the page, mm -hmm. you know, how it, how it's a palette and how we draw from it, you mm -hmm. know, to sort of create these worlds. Yeah. I, I was on your website this morning and uh, listening to a, a video um, poem that you'd done quite a while ago, I think, right? Was mm -hmm. that, how, how many years ago was that? Um, which which it, one was it? It's a, the, the video is a, a little girl following her father down the street. Oh, yeah. That was a friend of mine, Lee Anderson. Um, uh, uh, took that poem, How to Write a Poem, right, Theory Number, number theory number 62 or something yes, like that. Yes, Theory yeah. Number 62, yeah. right, right. He, he fell in love with that poem, and yeah. then he was uh, making poem videos at right. the time, and yeah. he created it in New yeah. York somewhere where he yeah. was living. Yeah. And that's great because uh, one, you know we're here on TV listening to you read your poems, but um, you have been involved in, in the written word in a lot of different ways. So uh, you were a journalist for a while, right? I was. Uh, I finished my MFA at Florida International University, came in as a fiction writer, and after one semester I was just, nope, mm -hmm. I'm going to be a poet right. instead. And then uh, after I graduated, you know, there's not a lot of uh, work for professional poets. Right, right. So I had been doing a little freelancing to support myself as a grad student, and uh, I, you know, was awarded a paid fellowship at New Times, mm -hmm. which... Uh, I kind think, of like our independent, right? Yeah, they were owned by the Village Voice Media mm -hmm. for a while. I don't really know what they're up to now, but I worked there for about a year and a half, and that was uh, hard news. Uh, it was a real education. I, I really learned uh, how the world works and how you know justice is not always available to us all. Mm. Um, it was very intense, and I decided I wanted to migrate over to arts and culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then that's what I did. The Miami Herald had a weekly called Street, and mm -hmm. I worked there for three years as a staff writer, writing about visual art, music, food, you know, just everything. Right, yeah. So was that good preparation for your later career as a kind of more of a full-time poet? <sighs> Absolutely. I, I really feel I found my voice as a journalist um, because you're on deadline all the time. 
And so you don't have a chance to be as precious maybe with mm. your words, although I totally was and <laughs> agonized over every single one. But, uh, but you're constantly writing mm -hmm. and you're constantly thinking about writing and trying to transpose the world that you're seeing. You're trying to document it in language. So that's really why I started cultivating my voice and becoming more confident about how I sounded. Right. You know, some people in graduate school, for example, I went to school with Richard Blanco, um, who was Barack Obama's poet laureate, and uh, Rick was, his voice was fully formed in school. Mm -hmm. In fact, his first book was his thesis. I mean, mm. he just, he just yeah, came out yeah. completely whole. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case with me, you know. I'm, I'm, or with most people. I'm very much a late bloomer in all aspects of my life, uh, so it, it took me a while to get there, but uh, working uh, as a journalist mm -hmm. definitely uh, prodded me down that path. Well, I think you told me that your first poem that you want to read it has kind of a Miami theme. Yes, so Maybe yes. we can make that connection and, and, and hear the poem. Oh, absolutely. Um, this is a poem, well, it's interesting because the first poem I ever wrote that was published was uh, in the Beacon, which was FIU's school newspaper, mm -hmm. and it was about my grandmother, and it's taken me all these years to write about my grandmother mm -hmm. again. So this is about her, and it just came out in a Gravy Journal, which is a magazine published by the Southern Foodways Alliance, which uh -huh. celebrates and also examines uh, Southern culture. Uh, all aspects. So for this issue, their summer issue, they focused on Florida and they're focusing on Bahamian cuisine and blues club and Tallahassee, um, just all kinds of stuff. And they, they featured a couple of poets and I was one of them. Okay. So I was really excited to see that they included poetry uh, as part of the oh, buffet. So cool. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, this has a Spanish title and uh, You'll learn what it means as the poem goes on. <laughs> and this is called Carne Fria, a love story. Her strip of a kitchen, the surface of the sun, when she cooked in the eternal summer of our city of reinvention. Miami still shunned us then, if you can imagine a place without the persistent glint of Spanish, and the way café levitates every rough juncture. She never spoke English, and what she might have understood about that time was buried beneath her eyes. Alive, even now in a hand-painted photograph, where I keep her near my own little stove. I never saw my grandmother make it, the meat arrived silvered and flecked with olives and the knowledge of a woman of obsidian will who survived by refusing not to. There are years since when she still visits me, circled in blue flame, and she looks pleased with her unseen arrangement, a home where she knows every tongue I ask her about my uncle Tito, if he is there with his books about astral projection and his chessboard, if the place she now lives has the same island light of where she was born and where she died. She shines and says nothing. She always preferred to listen, her face open to me, soft as gardenias she cut from the yard and set in a cup of water beside my bed. I ask her what the recipe was for her carne fria, if I will again taste its cold and wondrous salt. To this, she lifts her hand and presses it to my heart. And so many great sounds in there too. I, I, I wonder, I mean, is, is Spanish a kind of a background music as you're writing in English at all? Maybe. I mean, you know, who knows what's right. bubbling beneath the surface. But 
I think that the sound of my poems is very important mm, to me. Sure. I've always loved music. You know, I played a really uh, bad organ when I was a little okay. kid. <laughs> and, and you then, still sing, right? I, I do. I sing on occasion yeah. with my husband's band. And we were in a band together, which right. is kind of how we started dating. Right. Um, so it, just music has been a, a really important part of my life. And um, so the sound of the poem, the way the words... Mm -hmm. Uh, move together. I, I really listen to that and I read all my work out loud mm -hmm. and think about uh, rhyme and how I can sort of incorporate that but in a very subtle right. way, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Lots of internal rhymes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's important mm -hmm. to me. So mm -hmm. thanks for noticing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, uh, another thing that I'm always asked as a, as a poet is like, how, how do you get your poems published? So how in the world did you find out that this there, this magazine existed and, and would, would take poems? Well, I've heard of the magazine before. Um, there's been all kinds of uh, prose and poets that right. have been published it across right. the country. But um, honestly, like the editor just emailed me. Ah. I, I really don't know how that happened. And, uh, and asked for a poem. And she solicited well, my that's, book. Well, yeah. that's about as easy as yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, that happens sometimes, sure. Right, sure. Right. And then sometimes I just send stuff out and mm -hmm. it gets accepted. And a lot of times I send stuff out and get rejected. And right. There's a lot of rejection with being an artist and a writer. Uh -huh. And you just kind of have to muscle your way through it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that something that you let go as quickly as possible or do you try and find some lesson in rejection or how, how, what's your particular way of doing that? You know, it kind that? of depends where I'm at in my uh, life. Right. You know, if I'm really busy and I'm focusing on a lot of different projects, then it's kind of just, you know, right. that. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm feeling really vulnerable or invisible, right. then I feel, you know, kind of uh, dejected for a couple of days. Uh -huh. But, you know, at this point, I've been doing this so long that I know that that'll pass. Right, right. So you just kind of, you know, deal with it and right. then come back. Yeah, words of wisdom for aspiring poets. Well, um, you are one of our, you are our most recent ex-poet laureate now. So <laughs> number, I, I, nine. <laughs> <laughs> number nine. Number um, nine. And we recently had number 10 on, mm -hmm. Melinda was on. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your two years as the poet laureate of Santa Barbara. What were the kind of main accomplishments that you were most proud of? Well, first of all, that was an amazing experience that I had never imagined would happen to me. I never saw myself as a poet laureate. Right. And, uh, you know, even being in Santa Barbara at the time, it had been eight years, you know, around here, that's like you just moved here. Right. <laughs> uh, so I really didn't even think that I would that was possible, but then you actually approached me. I, I nominated you, yeah. And uh, nominated me, yeah. and uh, that was such an honor, thank you. Um, so, you know, when that actually transpired, I was just thrilled. I remember walking around my neighborhood at dusk by myself and just kind of like secretly <laughs> smiling to myself yeah. and like, I just was, I really made myself stop and enjoy it. Right. Because, you know, those kinds of successes don't always appear, right, right. Uh, as we know. Right. And uh, so I think it's important just to stop and slow down and relish it. And, yeah. uh, and I definitely did that. And then, uh, and then I kind of launched into my projects, mm -hmm. you know, which were um, just different projects. I did so many different things. I, I'm going to forget all of them now, <laughs> right. of course. But... Uh, I wrote a poem uh, for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation mm -hmm. for Sadako. I remember Day. that, yeah. Yeah, I did that. Um, I visited with a poetry club of um, seniors in Montecito. Uh -huh. um, I uh, facilitated poetry writing workshops, uh, community classes. I uh, continued with the Mission Poetry Series. And I launched, uh, co-launched with Gunpowder Press, your press, right. uh, the Alta California Chapbook Prize, which is awarded uh, at the time to two uh, Latinx poets uh, residing here in California and uh, is translated so that uh, Gunpowder Press publishes them in bilingual edition. All right, facing pages. Yeah, and facing pages. And that was really important to me because it was a way of sort of creating bridges between Spanish-speaking and English-speaking mm -hmm. communities. Um, so that's been a that's been a yeah, extremely I mean, that's rewarding been really project. exciting. And yeah. you were you were uh, the winner of the poet laureate fellowship from the Academy of American Poets in mm -hmm. order to help facilitate that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was really impressed by is the fact that you are actually the translator <laughs> of the, um, of, the um, 
of the poems. So um, it, clearly that Spanish that you heard growing up translated itself into some very fluent and eloquent, you know, written Spanish. It's interesting that you say that because um, the first set of books I translated completely on my own, right. and I really sweated that. Uh. <laughs> like I was just uh, pretty stressed out the whole time because I really wanted to get it sure, right, right, and I wanted to honor the words of the poets, and uh, and I also didn't want you know my mother, let's say reading it and saying, no, uh, Mima, this right. is not <laughs> this is not the way you say that. So, and then the second one, I had uh, an amazing uh, support system because uh, Alexandra Litton Regalado, who is a wonderful poet, right. um, uh, her book, Relinquenda, just uh, won the National Poetry Series about a year and a half ago, and uh, she was uh, one of the principal translators mm -hmm. uh, on that. Right. So that was that. That was a much more uh, relaxed uh -huh. uh, experience, especially because I get to work with her. You're co-translating. Yeah, and she's a good friend of mine. And you know, so much of my artistic practice is about community and mm -hmm. friendship. So anytime that I can kind of enter that space, it's mm -hmm. it's it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting that you asked me about the Spanish because for the first round of chapbooks, I remember things started activating in my head mm. that I hadn't thought about in a long time. Oh, interesting. And, you know, words would come back to me and many words I had to look up. But there was a sense of syntax that was started rising mm. to the surface and uh, I wasn't expecting that. And I could feel my Spanish uh, brain mm -hmm. coming to life, yeah, you know, kind of like Sleeping Beauty, you know, just awakening. <laughs> right. And uh, and it did, you know, to some degree. Um, and then when the second round uh, showed up, I, it wasn't as sleepy, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, groggy as right. it had been. Right. Uh, even though I speak Spanish, you know, all the time. I don't speak it as much in Santa Barbara as I do in Miami, where you walk into the store and people just greet you in Spanish, mm -hmm. and that's just a given. Right. Um, but I try and speak in Spanish with my mother whenever I speak to her, just so I don't lose it, right, you know, right. by living here. Right. Well, we just have about uh, 12 minutes left, and I, we've only heard one poem from you, so let's, let's okay. uh, let you... Uh, Papers with a new sure. poem. Um, let's go ahead and read a poem um, that was published in the New England uh, Journal, New England Review. New England Review, very prestigious journal. Yeah. And that was that was a super lucky one that I just sent it out. I sent out like a bunch, like ten or fifteen submissions, uh -huh. and uh, this poem was rejected by everyone except the best. Place. Except that one. <laughs> right. No, there were, it was rejected by some other good places too. <laughs> Uh, but there's a lot of Spanish words in here, and since we're talking about language, I thought that might be appropriate. Um, I will say uh, it has a, a couple of words that you might not know, paz y veneno. Veneno is uh, poison, and paz is peace. Uh, but everything else, I we'll think. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And uh, also I wanted to say that the first, uh, the title of the poem is the first line of the poem okay. as well. Thank you for reminding me, Cecropia moth, how you slow fold your summer kites away from the bite of go back to where you come from. I come from a city pretending to be an island, except for the parts where Nadia can eat, speak, live how they want. My stomach hurts again. The air is warm grass. A shadow cross of laughing gull moves over me and the park, and I don't think of resurrection, but of fists at the door. Breath held, an invasion of cruelty in the usual uniforms. My pencil says you are magical. The oracle says you chart flight with the bleak rays of the moon, a kind of compass so you know how to keep going. Thorax and legs threaded with the red of a stout altar candle or a rally of open mouths waiting for you to land. En la luna hay paz y veneno. 
That is to say, possibilities. La luna will swallow a punch or a prayer, whatever the future she endures. La luna, la luna, la luna, la luna. The tongue glimmers with arrival. There is no better way to say it. If you don't mind talking about it, I'm wondering what it's like to be a Florida poet right now in this particular political climate. Well, I've been thinking about that lately because I'm so far removed mm -hmm. right now from Florida and the Caribbean and that part of my life. I mean, I'm keeping track of what's going on politically, but it, it isn't the same emotional connection mm -hmm. as if I was still living there. Right. But, you know, I wrote that poem because I felt sort of, uh, not sort of, I felt enraged uh, about all the negative rhetoric that was being uh, repeated over and over again against uh, immigrants, against Spanish speakers, and I wanted to say something about that. And, and I think that uh, that poem came out almost whole. I mean, mm -hmm. I tinkered with it a mm -hmm. little, but it, it came out pretty intact. Um, and I think poetry can be a place where we celebrate beauty. You know, there's so much beauty here in Santa Barbara, right. but I also feel like it's a place we can pour our anger right. into or resentment or our grief. You know, the, it's the full spectrum of the human experience. And, uh, and so I, I try to do that, although I kind of tend to lean towards the, the melancholy <laughs> <laughs> outrage side. Right. Uh, but I have plenty of poems that also kind of... Uh, take a look at the natural world right. and how it gives me sustenance. Right. Well, I wonder to, to ask you what makes a good political poem, because I know sometimes I'll hear something that feels purely rhetorical, that doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it's that concerned with being a poem, whereas a, a poem like the one you just read clearly is a poem first, I think, with its political um, message kind of not necessarily trailing along, but it's not overwhelming the poem itself. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like some poems can feel sort of pedantic That's in a it, way. Yeah. But I, I think that um, what makes a good political, there's so many different ways right, to write a right, poem. And sure. sometimes you want to hear the pedantic. Right. Sometimes that's what you need to hear yeah. as a reader or a listener. Or in the, the occasion may demand it. Yeah. Exactly, right. or the occasion may demand it. So I, I don't really want to judge like which one is better than the other. For me personally, I like to write uh, political poems through the lens of my personal mm -hmm. experience okay. and sort of my own heart connection mm -hmm. to the subject. But, you know, different poets do different things. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, ask for another poem. Do you think we could go back to Tropicalia? This was a, an award-winning book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I actually thought I would read a, a one poem from here called uh, Florida Poem. Florida Poem. After summer rains, marble thumb snails and beetles blot the window screens with pearl and drone. Gardenias swell. Breathing is aquatic and travel a long drawl from bed to world. During drought, the heat becomes a devil girl with oven red lips who wants your brains puddled in a brass capped mason jar, who wants the silver stripped from your tongue the evening pulse between your legs, yes, she wants everything from you. Mm. You know, as you're reading another Florida poem, I'm, I'm thinking, I was kind of mentally going back through all the poets laureate of Santa Barbara, and I don't think any of us have actually been born in Santa Barbara. Some, really? Um, some have lived here for decades, you know, Perry Longo, Barry Spax, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, but I'm from Sacramento, you know, yeah. um, Melinda, our current poet laureate, is from Los Angeles. Um, we're sort of drawn to this place, and then we kind of make it our own, would you say? Mm -hmm. I, get, I didn't know that. I didn't know that everybody was from somewhere else. I, I think that's true. But, you know, I'm kind of accustomed to that living uh, in Miami for as many years as I mm. did, where everyone it's from is somewhere from else. everywhere. Right, yeah. 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 And so, you know, you hear all kinds of languages and eat all kinds of food and hear all kinds of music, and it's just this, you know... Uh, glorious and overwhelming royal of people mm -hmm. and culture 
And that's a great way to ideally describe our, our town. We have just four minutes left, and I want to get one more poem out of you if I can. Okay, let's see. Let's go ahead and bring it over to uh, Santa Barbara, maybe? Sure. Uh, okay. This is a poem that I wrote in January, and that was published in the Anna Kappa Review. Uh, Great journal. <laughs> that, that's right, that uh, you have some association right. with. Uh, it's called January Space Station. Arriving by window in a drift of blue scarves, light floats the alley gate, the hillside road framed with the spines of eucalyptus, a woman photographing the soft hem of the sea. I walk by men sleeping on the cold ground, where rogue violets also endure. I want someone to love them. I want to turn away. Rain has fed the creek with purpose. My ribs are filled with it too. At the other edge of the country, my mother coughs and coughs in the darkness. I ask the great silence to protect her. If there is a way to mend without words, I've never known it. Look up at the galaxy of sycamore leaves about to let go. How to touch the star of the day, what it might become, it's the longing that keeps me hanging on. If there is a way to mend without words, I've never known it. That's such a great line. Thank and that you. kind of goes into my last question with my last two minutes here with you. I, I like to ask folks for advice for people who are interested in their craft. And you teach poetry writing at Santa Barbara City College and elsewhere. What are, what's, you know, a, a minute's worth of advice that you would, you would give to aspiring poets? I think my biggest advice is to read and read and read and read poets of our time. Uh, certainly you want to read Shakespeare mm -hmm. and you want to read Basho and you want to read Emily Dickinson, um, but read the poets of our time because those are the voices that we speak in, mm -hmm. the voices that we uh, share our lives with. Um, so I would also suggest to read outside of the genre of poetry. Mm and read novels and fiction and essays and flash stories and articles in the newspaper and you know just whatever you're consuming make sure that it's uh, it's a value and it's it's written by somebody who loves language too and not just somebody that's cranking out you know widgets at the mm -hmm. factory right uh, because all of that will seep into you you know right. it all goes into the aquarium of your brain mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, you know, that'll start creating your own voice and your own lines and your own uh, way of documenting the world. Wow, beautiful way to end the show. Thank you so much, Emma, for being on the Thank you so much, David. Program. It was a pleasure to be here. The Creative Community is a co-production of TVSB in Santa Barbara and CAPS Media in Ventura. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time.